actually. So uh, I'm about to introduce Chris. Thank you for being the one to, uh, to speak up. Um, one of the silver linings, as we've had many conversations over the past several months, is that almost all of us have become much better, more adroit, uh, more familiar with the use of digital tools for ministry, which as pastors in our current time, that is as necessary as having learned to use the telephone um, or a word processor. It's just, this is how we communicate today. So, um, but sometimes we, we look at the digital reality as just a tool like the telephone and we don't think about the power at our fingertips for actual incredible impact for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so um, last night, Nelson Alcaron gave some uh, really good insights regarding digital evangelism, and we'll be sharing that with the whole group. And tomorrow, uh, Jennifer Star Revit and Turlock will be sharing a little bit about digital evangelism. And I thought it would be good to have three different perspectives that we could share. But uh, one of our leaders who has uh, really grasped the power and opportunity to leverage the digital world for the sake of the gospel. M many of you have, but Chris Hembury's done a really, really good job. And uh, I'm excited to hear from Chris. So without further ado, Chris, I turn the virtual floor over to you. Thanks, Mark. Uh, <laughs> how do I, um, Mark, when I share my screen, is there a way to still see people's faces or no? When you share your screen, people's faces will appear depending on how you set up your, your setting on the right side of what you share. Um, but it's, yeah. And everybody can choose how they want to see that. They can make their icons big or small. So. Uh, well, there we go. Cool. There you go. Except now when I play my viewer, it's going to, it's going to kill me, but that's okay. Hold on. Uh, actually, if you were to start your PowerPoint and then uh, don't do it while you're sharing the screen. We sh I probably should have given some instruction. Unshare your screen, start okay. your PowerPoint, and then uh, look for your shared PowerPoint again, and you'll be able to just go through the slides if you don't want to do it this way. Or you could just do this way. Whatever you want to do, Chris. I kind of want to be able to see folks. So hold on. All right, start my show. Well, no, it's, it's set up. It's on my lap. Nah, it's not going to work. I'll just, it's fine. It's fine. This is one of the things I'm going to talk about is being fluid. So I'm going to be fluid right now and just say, forget it. All right. So let me share my screen. All right, here we go. Okay. But you can all hear me, right? Yeah. Oh, wait, it's working, Mark. It's working. Look at that. All right, cool. cool. Good job, Chris. You got this. <laughs> that was all Mark, actually. Oh, true. Digital evangelism. All right. Digital evangelism. I don't follow instructions too well. I don't know how much of this is evangelism but it's all digital. So I'm kind of excited. So let's, let's start with, <clears throat> let's start with this. Uh, a lot of trends, a lot of trends having to do with in-person attendance and digital engagement were already very much trends long before the pandemic, but the pandemic has heightened or accelerated or grown those massively. Uh, <clears throat> A lot of Barna and different studies, in, even in 29, from 18 to 19, 2018 to 2019, massive, massive changes in the amount of people who are showing up in person to worship services with any regularity. So it's not like it's a brand new thing, <clears throat> which is good for most of us because churches that were ahead of the curve have given us a good roadmap. So there's some good data. So anyway, digital evangelism, we're going to start with some data because I love data. Uh, this is this data here is from Barna, but um, as churches have tried to reopen in person, the national average of percentage of attendance is at 35%. Meaning if you had a hundred people before the pandemic and you reopen on average, you're going to run about 35 people. <clears throat> Currently one out of three people who say that they have a church that is their church one out of three found that church by looking online for a church. And then my favorite stat, 
78% of people who visit a church will check the church out online first. And actually there's a number I forget off the top of my head, but it's like a dozen. They'll check out like a dozen churches before they pick one. Um, <clears throat> and we'll talk toward the end here about best practices. And the reason that 78% is important is because basically what that means is most people looking for a place to connect spiritually, Christians and non-Christians <clears throat> are gonna check you out on the internet first. And there are some glaring statistics about how quickly they will leave your website if it's not what they're looking for, even just visually. So sounds unspiritual, but it's really important. Uh, in the last 12 months, which is basically the pandemic, 17 million Americans who are not church attenders have visited a church website. That's from Gray Matter Research. That's phenomenal. Um, I find that to be a great stat. In other words, in the pandemic, when they're sitting around with less to do, when they're losing jobs, when their parents are getting sick, when they're getting sick, um, when the political climate is what it is, people are looking for answers and they're not only going to Christian churches, but one of the places they're going is to the church. And there is a tremendous amount of uh, competition for their eyes and a lot of ungodly content. So this is an important thing to know. <clears throat> 260 million Americans have a smartphone in their pocket. <clears throat> Here's why I bring that up. <clears throat> if you could hire, uh, you know, Elevation Worship Team to come be your worship team, and you could get Andy Stanley to come preach at your church, and you could build the best facility ever and have the greatest kit. I mean, if you had the best of everything, you could not even remotely begin to approach reaching 260 million people on your campus in your lifetime. But right now you can go live on your phone and talk and 260 million people could see you. It's a phenomenal tool. And uh, it leads me to my favorite quote of the day from uh, Kerry Newhoff, who says, everyone you want to reach is online, act like it. It's a massive, massive mission field. And even if it's, you're not somebody who likes the online thing or approves of it, and even though there's, I don't know if you've watched the social dilemma, I mean, there's scary stuff going on out there on the internet. It's, it's not something we can afford to ignore because basically, this is not an absolute statement, but basically everyone in America is on the internet now. Um, and they're on social media, even 80 year olds, they're all out there. And so we have to meet people in that place. I don't know if you're familiar, <clears throat> I can't remember if it was Eugene Peterson, but somebody about a decade ago <clears throat> talked about um, the idea of Paul writing the church talking about um, first space, second space, third space. And First space is um, uh, like public, like the marketplace. Second space would be coming to my place, my church. And third space is when people invite you into their home or their space. So the internet is the marketplace now. It is, everyone's there and everyone's listening and everyone's looking for content. So the church just has to be there in a positive way. We have to be there. So we need to, to act like it. <clears throat> which leads me to this uh, before we get into my like kind of main points you could write down or whatever. Uh, that's some quick data. <clears throat> Here's another piece of data that I don't have a resource for. <clears throat> many of us in ministry and many church folks and many Christians, <clears throat> we don't like the way things are going. The pandemic has been a drag. We've had to open and close. Um, <clears throat> we got people in our church. If we are meeting, who think we're the devil and we're killing people. We've got people in our church, if we don't meet, who think we're ungodly because we're not having enough faith to say God won't allow us to get sick. There's all this attack. There is, <clears throat> hey, you can meet online. Well, now you can meet outdoors, now in person. Oh, wait, back to online. Oh, wait, back in person. Uh, people are losing jobs. People are getting sick. We can lament that or, or we could ask the question, what has the pandemic made possible? So instead of lamenting what's been lost, let's focus on the opportunities that have been gained. <clears throat> when Stephen was stoned and the church was scattered, <clears throat> they probably, the people in all these towns where they landed, by the way, without their friends, without their jobs, without any kind of support, could have said, oh, that whole Jesus thing was really great while it lasted, but now it's been destroyed, right? They didn't sit around and whine and say, I wish we had a temple, 
they said, what has this made possible? What it made possible was the Great Commission because they were forced to go to these new communities and live out the gospel. And it's the reason that Christianity survived, quite frankly. So this horrible thing turned into a huge possibility. So as I begin to unpack for just a few minutes, just the stuff I found that I thought would be helpful, which may or may not be, we have to approach it with this mindset of not, oh, I'm stuck in this place. I wish church was what it used to be, but I'll try. No, we should be excited to say, hey, look what's possible. Everybody's in the same boat. Everybody's hurting. Everybody's questioning politics and everybody's questioning the church. And is it okay to meet? There are brand new possibilities. And I should note, uh, they are finite. We'll talk a lot more about this at Me4 in February 20-something, 3rd. There's a little plug for you. Make sure you register for Me4. Uh, <clears throat> there's, a, there's, a, uh, there's a window that is finite where people are going to be looking for community. They're going to be looking for connection. And the church can meet that. So what has the pandemic made possible? So let's talk because I was asked to talk about digital outreach, digital evangelism. We could go a lot of places from that last slide, but we're just going to talk about digital forms, mostly online forms. So how do we leverage the online platform? Here we go. <clears throat> um, first things first, if you don't tell your story, someone else will. <clears throat> if you're not active on social media, for example, people in your church are, and they're going to share on their, on their own sites. They're going to share on Google reviews. They're going to talk about your church. There's going to be a narrative, whether you want there to be or not. So it's important that we're active to be able to form the narrative, that we are proactive in saying, here's what we're about. So when people see their friend on Facebook say, this church hates everybody, they're homophobic, terrible people, people could click on that, go to your website if it exists, click on what we believe if it exists, and see why you feel the way you do and how you love people. They can listen to your sermons if you have those online and go, oh, here's one on marriage. Let me listen to that. And they can go, oh, they don't hate me, right? So there's a huge opportunity, massive, massive point. If you don't control the narrative, if you don't tell your story, they're not going to leave you alone. It's out there. Your church is being talked about on social media. I guarantee it, every church. <clears throat> so here's my tips. <clears throat> Make plans for the month, not the millennium. <laughs> Church, I keep hearing this, that church as we know it is over. That may not be true. Church could be, in a year, it could look very much like it used to. Hopefully it doesn't, because again, we have this possibility. <clears throat> I am like the king of, of strategic long-term plans. So this slide makes me nervous because I hate being wishy-washy and I don't like making it look like I'm changing things every 30 seconds. <clears throat> but right now, culture, um, the political climate, the pandemic restrictions and technology are all changing so rapidly that we have to be ready to innovatively meet those changes. <clears throat> so even if your, your default is, well, we're going to launch this podcast and then six weeks from now, you find out it's a good idea to change it completely or destroy it. Your, your, your guts might be saying, that's not how I lead. I have to be consistent and I have to give it the effort. Don't be afraid to try something new, even if it's for five weeks. And don't be afraid to scrap it if it's not working. Don't worry about looking like you don't know what you're doing. No one knows what they're doing right now. Because again, everything's changing so fast. So as you, I'm talking just about digital media. You still need long range strategic plans for sure. But just in terms of your digital presence <clears throat> and what your website looks like and or what platforms are we on, and how are we following up with people? How are we doing all this stuff? Don't get caught up in this is the way we're going to do it forever. It could change rapidly. <clears throat> Literally tomorrow, <clears throat> tomorrow we could see on TV that the pandemic has, uh, you know, mutated into this killer strain and killed a million people on the East Coast. And that would radically change our thinking. I mean, we're going to talk after this with superintendent about how to reopen safely which is good, but literally tomorrow, it could be a completely moot point. So be, be ready to shift, okay? That makes sense? Awesome. <clears throat> I can't see my screen, but I, I, I don't know what that says. Keep the, what does it say? I can't even see it. Keep the mission ahead of the method? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Okay. <coughs> well, listen, digital media is still and will always be a strategic method. It's not our mission. And we can't fall into the same traps we've fallen into before, where, for example, the movement to say, let's do things with excellence. Let's have really cool buildings and let's have excellent attractional worship, which is a good thing, by the way. But it's not a good thing when that becomes the mission, that my goal in pastoring is to make sure we have the best stuff. <clears throat> you want to have good online systems, but let us not fall into the trap together of all of a sudden our whole job is to make sure our online presence is awesome. And before we know it, we're not really doing the mission. Uh, you know, we don't want to fall into the attractional consumerism trap. So it's not, it is not, our mission is not, let's have the best online ministry on the planet. Our mission is the great commission. And the question of digital evangelism is how can we leverage the digital world to fulfill the mission? So can't let it become our mission or we have lost. Okay, cool. Uh, innovate and invest digitally. I like to think of myself as fairly capable. I, I, I can be very, very arrogant. And so I, I feel like I can do anything if I take a minute to study it. <coughs> Turns out I'm not an expert on technology. So after months of trying to be one, I emailed a friend of mine who is in fact an expert and said, please do this for me. I will hire your company. I know not all of us have funds to do this. <clears throat> I think the conference would be willing to help with that if you had a good plan, but here's the point. <clears throat> if you don't know what you're doing, it's okay to find people to help you. <clears throat> it is a time and it's a short-term thing. You can contract this. Erin Lackey, if she has time, can help you. You cannot ask her to help you for free because she's helping the conference. That's her business. So you would need to pay her. Um, there's some other, I'll give you some names at the end, but we need to innovate and we need to invest digitally. <coughs> there are lots of cheap options to be able to do things well, but if you don't know what you're doing um, and you need help, there are ways you can spend a little money and get a massive boost. So put your money where your mission field is. If your entire community is online, if your town is really shut down and some towns are more than others, then it's important that right now you have a really good digital platform. <clears throat> if all you know how to do is hit Facebook Live and prop your phone up, I get that and that's okay. But with a tiny bit of effort from an outside source that you can pay a few hundred dollars to, to set you up, you could all of a sudden go from that to something that looks pretty good. So innovate and invest digitally. If you want to do this, it takes some effort, takes some money, and it takes some know-how. And I don't know about you, but I didn't study in school, like between theology and Bible class, there was nothing about, well, the internet didn't exist, but there was nothing, there was nothing about how to do this stuff. So find somebody who knows what they're doing, even if they're not a Christian, just find somebody and say, can you help me with my digital platform? Don't be afraid. <clears throat> However, value authenticity over awesome technology. Uh, Kerry Newhoff this isn't literally from him, but he had an article on this. And this is quotes from the article from somebody else who says stuff. And there's two great quotes. Production value becomes less important when there's a bigger battle. And when it comes to video, simple and real beats polished and professional. The reality is no matter who you hire or how great my presentation is uh, or how much you learn, <coughs> listen carefully. I love you all. No one in our conference is going to come remotely close to putting up the quality of product that Centerpoint in Murrieta or Bethel or Andy Stanley's church is able to put on the internet. It's not going to happen. They literally have people who work for NBC running their online stuff. Like, it's not going to happen. Okay. Doesn't mean we don't need quality. <laughs> but what we can do that those churches cannot do is be authentic in our local community online. So as people are looking for local church content and saying, oh, Facebook just popped up. There's a church in my area that's doing a worship service. They all click on that. We can be authentic. 
even over the internet, people can sense a lack of authenticity. So value, you still need to have good tech. You still need to work. I just mentioned that you need to hire people and do it well, but don't get too caught up in production. We're in a strange season. We're in kind of a crisis mode. So getting something authentic online is more important than waiting till it's perfect and looks as good as, you know, Hillsong's looks. It's not going to, so don't try, okay? Unless you can, maybe you can, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you have like ridiculous budget or something. So value authenticity over awesome tech. Uh, next slide, make the online media your on-ramp, not your freeway. <coughs> I'm not sure about this statement, but I think it's true. We cannot do an online only ministry. There are ministries that can be online only, but in terms of fulfilling the Great Commission as a local church, over the course of long periods of time, at some point, discipleship is going to have to take place in other ways. We're trying to figure those ways out. <laughs> All I mean by this is make sure that your online stuff is pointing people to some kind of relational connection. <clears throat> so maybe I'm not cl being clear there. It's good to have stuff online, but if you have a worship service online and a button they can click to read about how to get saved and they click that and then there's a button to click to be discipled and it's a bunch of videos, that's all excellent. But at some point you need to be pointing people to community, to real people, to real interaction, which you can do with Zoom or FaceTime, but everything can't be a la carte on the internet. At some point we have to point people to relational discipleship. <clears throat> In other words, <clears throat> investing and becoming an expert on the online thing is not going to replace the actual ministry of the church. It's just a tool. It's a good tool, but it can't be your only thing. And at some point, God willing, things are going to be quote unquote normal. And you're going to have to learn to, you know, do things in person again. So <clears throat> ultimately your online stuff should be on ramps that point people to connect, you know, hey, you want to connect with us at Gaylene's church? Gaylene did something really cool. I don't know if you guys saw this. They did a Zoom ladies coffee thing. That's what I'm talking about. Like maybe online, there's a link to that and people can go, oh, I can connect on Zoom and meet some ladies in my living room on my computer. That's the kind of stuff we need to point people to, not just content. So it's an on-ramp. It's not the path. Okay. <clears throat> Work smarter. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> if you've been taping or recording stuff for years, uh, it's okay to put them back on the internet. Not all 260 million people with smartphones have seen your sermon from 2014. It's not the end of the world to put it up. <coughs> it's not wrong to see a great sermon by Francis Chan and put it on your website and go, hey, we're learning about this topic. Here's Francis Chan talking about it. You don't have to recreate everything. There's nothing wrong with going to group.com and downloading kids content and putting it on your webpage. Personal is good and engagement is good, of course, but there's nothing wrong with working. So you don't have to reinvent everything. Um, you can use existing tools. Superintendent Mark has tons of stuff. He's asked lots of us to do that's right there on the NUB website that you can put on. Um, <clears throat> and that goes beyond your digital media. If digital media is taking more time and so you don't have time to do some other stuff, like talk to your properties team, finance team, go, hey, I want you guys to check out this PowerPoint on the conference website that talks all about our goal. Like just work smarter, repurpose stuff, reuse stuff. <clears throat> if you're doing fully produced worship services, not live, there's nothing wrong with cropping in your music from four weeks ago and just using the same worship set. There's nothing wrong with that. You don't have to do brand new stuff every time. So, um, work smarter. And then have a stinking discipleship system in place. <laughs> this is a humble brag, and I, I don't mean it to be braggy, but it's a great story. <clears throat> Before the last general conference, <clears throat> the, the, or maybe it was two ago, two, two general conferences ago, <clears throat> the bishops put together all this stuff about who we're gonna, what we're going to be about. And one of them was discipling deeply. <clears throat> and I had this little church in the middle of nowhere in Turlock where I was making a few disciples. And I got this call saying, could you make a video about how to make disciples? And I said, no, there's no, there's somebody doing it better. And the guy said, okay. 
And then Bishop Matt Thomas called me and said, there's nobody doing it well, go ahead and do the video. And I was, I was, I was dumbstruck. Um, we're bad at this. We're all bad at this. So there are lots of opportunities in the conference to learn this stuff. Superintendent Mark's very good at it. There are ways to do it. And at the risk of being too um, over the top here, your system's not really that important. <laughs> Just have one, have a stinking plan and have it ready because as you begin to do well online slash in person, these people who show up and are looking for community, they're going to need to be discipled and we need to be ready for them. I also would, would think that God's going to send those people to a place that's ready for them. And if you're not ready for them, God's not sending them to you. If you want to see people come to faith, don't just, I know this is about evangelism. You can't just go look at all this cool stuff we can put on the internet to get more people to watch us and click a button that says they accept Jesus. So what? If they're not being discipled, that fades. So the goal is to make disciples, not to make people who will click a button. We're not making converts, we're making disciples, okay? Um, Jesus said, as you go, make disciples, not converts. Converts is almost an irrelevant number because a lot of them don't take root. So it's important, but disciples is what we need to count leaders developed. So create a discipleship plan. There are seriously, I'm not just saying this, there are great resources on the conference website for that. Uh, Superintendent Mark can help you. He can point you to pastors in our conference who can help you who do it really well. We have people that do it very well. Um, Sam Manu does this really well. Nelson does this really well. There are people who can help you. So we need to have a discipleship plan ready to go <clears throat> so that when God sends people, um, we're ready, right? Best practices and tips. I stole all this, by the way. I don't, I don't know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> Number one, <clears throat> now I, I get told this a lot, get professional help. I'm told that in a very different context, I think. But uh, if you seriously, don't be arrogant about this. If you aren't an expert, just pay somebody. Listen carefully. I wasted 100 hours trying to figure this junk out for our live stream. I finally sent an email to my buddy, Ben Forsberg, who's a church planter in our denomination in Arizona, has a company on the side. He is an absolute expert in brand management, marketing, digital media, online. <laughs> Paid him some money. They do all of our web hosting. We literally wanted to start a podcast two weeks ago. <clears throat> and I spent an entire day trying to figure it out because I thought it would be easy. Couldn't get it to work. Spent a hundred bucks and couldn't get it to work. I emailed Ben within 10 minutes. I was on a video call with a guy he work, who works for him. The guy said, type in www.simplecast.com and click the start button. 15 minutes later, our entire podcast was done for two. I mean, people who know what they're doing, it is worth the money. It is worth the time. Um, <clears throat> well told, by the way, 150 bucks a month. <clears throat> they do all your web hosting and you get in-person, very quick response to any issue you have. They are quite a bit more expensive, like depending on what you want, but to get you set up. But once you're going, they're very affordable. And right now, 10% off anybody in our conference who wants their help. So they have an a la carte thing. They can start from scratch or they can just look at what you do and make suggestions and give you tiered options. They're very good at what they do and they do it for businesses. But Ben happens to be a pastor. So they do it really well for churches too. And they're free Methodists. Erin is also excellent, particularly at the online social media stuff, but please don't take advantage of her. If you want her help, ask her what it costs and pay her. It's her job. Okay. <clears throat> One of the things I saw that I wanted to put on here as I was researching more video, less text industry consultants report that video is eight times more effective than text. I saw another stat that said people read about 10% of what's written on a page. So when they go to your post or your page, if they have to hit, you know, on Facebook, when you have a post and you have to hit see more to see the whole thing, people will just not do that. They just won't read it. It's too long. So use video, quick, under a minute videos. Most effective thing. This is the coolest thing, number three, which I just learned this week. <clears throat> I know I said be authentic. I meant that. But quality does matter. Online visitors make their decision about your church within milliseconds. A study by Nucleus Church Group, that's a group that does studies, 
revealed that 96.2% of websites fail the first impression test because 96.2% of respondents say that design is impactful. In other words, 96% of people said when they were asked, why did you click on that website to a church and only stay on for three seconds and leave? And it's because they immediately, just by how it looked, thought this place is lame. Isn't that nuts? I would think content matters. And it does matter, but it doesn't matter at all if they don't stay for more than three seconds. I was dumbfounded by that. So again, get help from someone who knows what they're talking about. I do not know what I'm talking about. I'm not an expert on this, but we've had pretty good content finally now because I found somebody who was an expert and asked them to do it for me. So <clears throat> this is not generally in the wheelhouse of a pastor. It might be, but most pastors were not trained for this. So find people who are and get some help. 96% um, of people <clears throat> decide within 50 milliseconds if they're going to stick on your site. That's incredible. So quality of your content matters once they're on there, but they're never going to get to your content if it's lame or if it's skipping. Or I think I also read if it takes more than three seconds to load your page or video, they'll just click off to another website. So you can, again, by having good hosting, you can make sure you're faster than three seconds. So, so do that. <clears throat> Again, talk to an expert on number four. Erin knows this stuff. You could pay her for a one hour consultancy. She could help you out here. There are strategic technological ways to make sure that your church or the things you're good at pop up in search engines. Eight out of 10 people who are looking for a church are gonna Google it. They're gonna go into the website and they're gonna Google uh, Santa Cruz greater area church. And if Coralitas wants to pop up on that list quickly, there are ways you can do that. I don't understand that, but there are ways you can use keywords and there are ways you can pay a little bit of money. Uh, we started using Facebook ads. I can spend $7 and instead of 500 people seeing our posts, 5,000 people within 10 miles of our church, it pops it up on their Facebook post. We actually have a lady in one of our small group studies, Katie Small Group, we've never met, who said, hey, I found you on Facebook and I want to be a part of this online group. Okay, so pretty cool. So maximize your visibility. <clears throat> Number five, again, if you get professional help, they'll do all this for you. But if they don't, make sure connection points are obvious and intuitive. <clears throat> if you're live streaming on the internet and you say something like during your next steps portion of your sermon, which everyone should always have, here's how you can apply your sermon. Hey, Here's how you can apply what we talked about today about community. Click on the link, join one of our small groups. If they have to click 47 things and look around to find that, it ain't going to happen. So make a big, huge button for that week that says connect to small group. So all they got to do is click it and it takes them right to the form. I do not know how to do that, but the people we asked to do it for us set that up for us. So I can't help you with that. Aaron can help you. Ben Forsberg or others can help you. Um, but find somebody to help you do that. People will move away from your page if it's not obvious and intuitive. <clears throat> so uh, for example, on your homepage, right on the homepage of your church, right now anyway, should be a video player with your most recent sermon or with a quick one minute video from one of you saying, hey, welcome. And there should be a big button that says, watch our live streams. If they have to click about ministries, sermons, video, February, four, you, they'll never do it. They will never do it. Uh, there's too much good stuff out there and people have a, an attention span on the internet of like one second. They're used to clicking on TikTok or Facebook and getting what they want immediately. So make it obvious, make it intuitive. <clears throat> and number six, uh, humans like to see humans. So it's okay to use stock stuff, but when you think about, gra I just learned this the last month too. Um, when you think about graphics, um, humans like to see humans. So make sure you have people and make sure you have real church members featured. And here's a really cool tip I learned. 80% of your social media content needs to be social. <coughs> so if somebody goes to your church Facebook and the first 15 posts are a picture, like a picture of a, I don't know, a picture of a computer and then a little statement that says, hey, we're looking for people that'll be on our tech team. Contact the church office. And they scroll down. The next one is, hey, this is Sally. Just want everybody to know my neighbor lost her dog. And if you want to help me find the dog, call me. 
with no number because we all know Sally. And the next one is, you know, whatever. That's bad. People go to social media to make social connection. So what they want to see is, hey, here's a picture of six guys from the church outside playing basketball. Well, that's cool. Hey, here's a picture of Pastor Chris with his arm around our properties person as they look out on the next plan for our building. Well, that's cool. They want to see connection. They want to see a community they can be a part of. So 80% is what I was reading, 75 to 80. It's okay to have some stuff on there because you got to communicate info. But if it's just a bunch of admin or a bunch of inside stuff, like call Debbie, you can't put call Debbie because a visitor doesn't know Debbie, right? <laughs> so put click this link if you want to do. So have real humans. Uh, that's extremely important. <coughs> Here we go. Last slide. There are a million things you can do digitally. <clears throat> we just started podcasting because <clears throat> it's really easy. Uh, we use um, whatever it says on there, what, Simplecast, 15 bucks a month. <clears throat> they host all your stuff so it's not taking up stuff on your webpage. <clears throat> I have like a gazillion gigabytes of, of data. I do a little three minute devotional starter every day for our church, like a prayer thing. All you have to do is pay the 15 bucks a month it's so easy and so intuitive. You can do it on your phone if you don't have a microphone or a system. And all of a sudden you've got a podcast. It automatically puts it on um, iHeartRadio and Apple iTunes out. If you want that, it's out there. 15 bucks a month. <clears throat> Podcasts are sometimes good. Sometimes they're bad. You can record your sermons as MP3s and put them out there. 15 bucks. Super easy. <clears throat> Live streaming. Tons of great stuff. Wirecast is great. Sling Studio is great. Those cost a lot of money. O OBS is completely free. <clears throat> Very intuitive. I think, I think the table uses OBS. James and Aaron's church, they do a great job with their online stuff. Really good job. It's just a, a laptop and OBS. It's all they use. So it's really, really good. Um, <clears throat> check that out for free. <clears throat> Social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all free. Um, those are kind of the big ones. There's other ones now. But there's also paid options on there. And I would suggest you budget... I mean, just a little bit. I mean, 20 bucks a month for some of your biggest Facebook posts. You can, you can click on add and it's very intuitive. Uh, or again, Erin can help you with this if you pay her. <clears throat> um, you can click on add and you can pick and say, hey, I want 18 to 40 year olds within 10 miles of my church to see this. And for like seven bucks for five days, Facebook will pop it up in front of their face. So lots of options, um, lots of stuff you can do. <clears throat> I'm all done. Let me summarize this way. Most important things there to me, because I don't really know what I'm talking about. I threw most of that together, but here's things I do know. Okay. We need to think about what the current climate in our country has made possible instead of getting sad and whiny about the things that aren't possible. And, Oh, so let's not strive to hold on to what the church was. Let's just talk about what the church can be and let's get on board. <clears throat> Number two, most important thing it's about discipleship. We need to have people on the internet because that's where people are. We need to have likes. We need to have hits. We need to have check-ins. We need people watching our videos. But none of that matters if we're not somehow assimilating them, those who respond into body life and into discipleship. So let's not fall into the trap again of making the online world our mission. It is not. It's just the marketplace where we go and help people engage. By the way, side note, <clears throat> two side notes I read, but didn't include. <clears throat> I read some pretty good research, but I didn't know the source, so I didn't include it. But it was talking about older generations getting into tech. And what they found was that even the most non-techie 85-year-old, I hate technology people, will learn the technology if they see value in what they're going to get from it. <clears throat> so don't be sitting there going, my church won't do this. They will if you give it value. <clears throat> Number two, even before this all started, this was a trend, but listen, attendance is dead. People aren't wanting to be a part of showing up to something. Increasingly, what people want is a way to join and engage in a mission. <clears throat> so make sure what you do share online, always with every sermon you do, every content, make sure you connect it back to a mission, not, hey, come be here and listen to us in person. There's no reason to do that. They're listening to you on the internet. 
So try to try to point people to mission. People want to engage the mission. So if you're talking about service and loving your community, have a next step of, hey, we're going to practice this by putting together these food bags and delivering them to this place in town. By the way, if you want to help us, even if you're not a part of our church, you can come down at two o'clock. Please wear a mask. We're going to be separated and we're going to put these bags together. Even if you've never been here before, we'd love your help. That's what people are looking for. They want to engage together in mission, not just take content. So that's what I got. Uh, any questions? Raise your hand if you have a question and uh, we'll call on you. <clears throat> Look at that. I did such a good job. Nobody has any questions. Luke has a question. Please unmute and go for it, brother. You said that you were using OBS at the table? I believe so. Yeah, have you tried it? Yeah, I used it when we first started. It, it's not as fancy, you can't do as many things, but it works well and it's completely free. I don't need a lot of empathy. I tried to work with OBS for about three months back in late spring, early summer. Yeah. And it worked for me uh, all the time, every time I did some kind of test during the, work, during the week. And then on Sunday morning, it crashed my live stream every time. And really? I don't know why that is. And nobody oh. else that I've spoken to has had that experience. Everybody else yeah. is like, yeah, sure, it's great. Just do it. Um, oh, so I, I was looking for someone I could talk to to try and figure out why. Yeah, call um, Matt Monero will be the guy to talk to. Matt would be able to help you. Thank you. I'm almost positive they're still using OBS. I'm not. When I watch their stream, it looks like they are. But Thank you very much. Is there another question? Raise your hand. No? Um, Chris, that was really, really good. It was actually, some of the uh, early parts of your sharing, some of the statistics brought home uh, some even deeper realization for me. I learned a lot uh, listening to your presentation today. I really appreciate that. Uh, friends, if you are like really interested in looking at some ways that churches are, are leveraging social media, uh, internet, et cetera. There are three people that are, uh, three churches represented here right now that are doing it super, super well. And when I, if I don't mention your church, don't be mad. Everybody's doing it, I know. But, um, but FCC, uh, Foothills Christian Community Church, which is where Chris leads, is doing it really, really well. Um, also, in terms of being able to present and bring people in using Zoom and, and live casting, uh, the folks at the Hayward Free Methodist Church uh, under Ben's leadership are doing it very, very well. They, they've uh, organized the way to do live streaming in a way that is high quality, really engaging, and then connects with the community. Uh, and probably the the most creative church that is operating online is Coralitos, and that's uh, uh, Theo and Gay Leaner with us. And if you want to look at um, some creative ways, one of the things that they've done that's uh, very, very cool, and all of our churches have done that, Chris, your church has done that, um, but they're very intentional about bringing in people from the church and community and uh, making sure that part of their digital expression is sharing work that they've done recording people throughout the week or getting tidbits sent in to them. So um, although you're not meeting you know, in person, there's a real sense that the church as a whole is still connected and still actively engaged. So there's lots of ways um, that our church is doing some really creative stuff. We need to keep upping our game. Chris, a big takeaway uh, for me from what you shared was invest in this. Um, you know, you get what you pay for. Free, uh, you get free. <laughs> and there's a lot of good stuff you can do for free, and you don't have to be a multi-billionaire to have a high-quality uh, internet expression. But uh, you do have to invest something, both time and money, uh, into that. And then finally, I shared just uh, two links. Chris shared Ben Forberg, Forsberg, Forberg's, I'm sorry, I probably don't have that right. Um, email, and I would encourage you to connect with him. That's a great resource. Uh, I just shared two things. One, if you really like Chris's presentation, he uh, the, visually, it's really good. Uh, he uses beautiful AI rather than PowerPoint, for example, 
which is um, one of my personal favorite tools as well. And so I shared the link. If you're interested, it's easier to put together beautiful uh, and engaging presentations than PowerPoint. And then also uh, Chris mentioned that videos are really helpful. A very low cost, although it does cost something, it's not free. Um, provider for that is uh, uh, Promo, which I threw a link on there for you as well. You can put together uh, engaging, very easy to do short videos that you can share um, online as uh, promotions for your church and things that are happening in your church life. I just wanted to toss that out. Uh, I see a hand, Gailene. Um, the, the resources that you just mentioned with Promo and with Beautiful, are those free? There's modest costs um, for each, but again, they're modest. I, I think at Beautiful AI, they might have a free version and a paid version. Usually, if I go to a product that has a free version and a paid version and I like it, I just use the paid version. <laughs> I, I don't bother messing with whatever their free version is. So, um, Thank you. And then I saw another hand, uh, Jorge. Uh, first of all, thank you, Pastor Chris. Totally well thought out and well convicting. Or I'm I'm a bit of a late adopter, uh, and it has to do with the age of our congregation. It's kind of a chicken and egg thing because I have a Twitter account, I have an Instagram account, I have four followers on Twitter, and I think Superintendent's one of them. And uh, so it's kind of that dilemma of. I don't put stuff on there because I don't have a lot of people, but then my mind tells me I don't have a lot of people because I don't put stuff on there. And so, you know, what Pastor Chris said was so relevant of I'm now uploading, forwarding, sharing the conference and the, and the denominational information because it's so good. And so when, uh, you know, Bishop put out something on social justice, like that's on my front webpage, but I have to invest on the website. I, I just have to do it because it, it's not where it needs to be. I don't have the ability to get it there and we've kind of piecemealed it together. So I really want to talk to either Ben and or Aaron and, and just, you know, like you said, if you do a little investment on the front end, then maintenance and keeping it good looking is not a difficult chore. And exactly it, right. it, it's more like doing um, Microsoft Word after that. It's just you know, dropping and placing and updating. So yeah, I really appreciate that. Very convicting. We have a, a, a volunteer led Zoom Bible study Monday through Saturday at 5 p.m. And it ranges from maybe like 55 up to 89. 89 year old woman using it every single day except for Sunday. They don't do it on Sunday. So, you know, that's amazing. And it's all led by volunteers. So that it, it can be done. Part of me thinks like, uh, but it, it's meeting a need. And that's what Pastor Chris said. If they see it meets a need or it has value, they're willing to give it a try. I would have said two years ago, no way, no how, but obviously it's happening. Very good. Well, there's a whole lot more that we could go into with this. Chris, you really set the table and served a delicious meal. Um, it was fantastic. Um, and I'll be talking about me four and some of what we'll be learning there a little bit later. Uh, but I do want to drop this note in, in your mind right now. The uh, conference revitalization team, um, which, as you know, operates the type three-year planning engagement, went instead this year, because of the situation we're in, to looking at every church's website, Facebook presence, and responses to, uh, to reaching out on your Facebook site, uh, telephone, email, whatever. And... Um, so they finished that work and probably within uh, the next week or two, you'll get a little summary. That's not huge, just a one page summary of these completely non-tech savvy people, which are actually the kind of people you want looking at your website uh, to give you some feedback regarding um, its appearance, its ease of use and things of that nature. So you're going to get that, uh, take it in the spirit that it's intended, cooperation and love it's you know um, and hopefully it will give you something to, to think about uh, and some you know things to act on it'll also come with a page of resources um, 
Chris has brought uh, some resources today that aren't on that page is great. Thank you so much. Some other resources that, uh, that you can check out in terms of improving your digital serve. Uh, so that's coming out soon. And again, please, when you get it, read it in the spirit in which it is intended. However, the checklist and the training that went up front for the group before they uh, did the work uh, follows actually along the lines of many of the things that Chris talked about in terms of what makes for uh, a good, healthy, and well and often visited web and presence site. If you have things like Snapchat, Twitter, uh, WhatsApp, WhatsApp, by the way, is huge in the Hispanic and uh, Asian connections in our conference. We didn't look at any of those things. So if, for example, the, the response to your church is, well, there's you know clearly nothing going on connecting groups digitally, and you have an amazing WhatsApp that's connecting 15 groups of you know 100 each, again, take it for what it's worth. We just didn't look at some of those things. So. Um, Okay, well, praise the Lord. Thank you again, Chris, everybody. Another big round of applause.